Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, and we're going to talk about theater of the mind versus miniatures and terrain. And this is the closing episode of this uh, theater, Dungeons and Dragons theater of the mind, or miniatures versus terrain, um, the closing of the series. Right. So I want to talk about two things today. I want to talk about sourcing and why miniature, why you should continue to use miniatures. All right, so let's talk about this. So this is for Dungeon Masters. Um, if you are a Dungeon Master, you should have a uh, a collection that is no less than $100, $100 of miniatures and $35 of, of representative mi miniatures and no more than $3,000 worth of miniatures and $1,500 worth of not, um versus of representative miniatures. But what I want to talk about today is sourcing. How should it be sourced? There's only one path to get to play Dungeons and Dragons right, in my humble opinion, and that is to source your three, your your forty five hundred dollar collection from three sources. You need real tabletop role playing game sources, right? So you need real miniatures. Now, what are those, right? Uh, Reaper Bones, Whiz Kids, Dungeons and Dragons, um, Whiz Kids, Dungeons and Dragons miniatures. Uh, Pathfinder miniatures, all of them are excellent sources. And then there are also fantastic Kickstarters um, for a host of other different types of miniatures. And all of those are fantastic tabletop role-playing game sources for your miniatures. That's one. That's one. So you need three separate sources for your miniatures, okay? That's one source, okay? Real TTPRG manufa miniature manufacturers. Next is represent, representative minis, right? So next, you need to be buying board games that have miniatures in them. And the easiest way to do this is to buy board games from board gamers who um, who are either finished playing the, the game or bought the game and didn't like it or bought the game, loved it, and then played it so much that they lost some of the parts, right? Now, you're not gonna play it as a board game, so it doesn't matter if a third of the parts are missing. You're just buying it for the tokens and the minis that are in the game, right? And the representative miniatures, small cubes that are the same size as a 25 millimeter to 32 millimeter, one inch uh, standard Dungeons & Dragons uh, miniature, okay? And so, um, you know, so basically this is, uh, you know, and so this is, where, so basically, you're going to get your your second source is board games. They're super cheap, and they will allow you to expand your miniatures collection far, far more expansively at a much lower price than if you continue to buy from tabletop roll uh, tabletop miniature manufacturers. The tabletop miniature manufacturers are outrageously expensive compared to board games. The last is source is craft shops and hardware shops and any other shops that are not gaming shops. So basically, like, here's a good example. Like, I, you know, for a sphere of power, right? I, ha I, I went to a toy shop and I bought marbles. I bought them actually at Toys R Us before they went out of business. It might be hard to find. Oh, actually, it's not hard to find toy shops. You can find toys in any, um, in any Walmart or in Target, right? So you can go and just buy marbles, right? And so I bought marbles, and those are my like spheres of power. But if I just put them down, they roll around on the table, right? So what I did was I went to Lowe's uh, or Home Depot is fine, and I got you know s rings of silver and copper and gold, right? Like now, not literal gold; it just looks like gold. And these rings sit below these marbles, and then I, you know, and and I will say, okay. You know, this is a, a bonded, you know, power orb of this wizard, right? And, you know, if he bonds it on the silver ring, it does X. And if he bonds it on the copper ring, it does Y. And if he bonds it on the gold ring, it does Z, right? You know, and that came from toy shops and hardware shops, right? And so that should be your third source is non, non-board game, non-gaming sources, non-gaming shops. And this is important because you can really delight your um, your players because you will get stuff from these other shops that they've never seen and that they don't expect and that they don't ha they don't understand. I get questions a lot from my players. 
They're like, where did you get these like minis? You know, and, and let me let me give you a line from the Prestige. Never tell them your secret. They will help. They will hate you for it, right? Like, um, and it's true. Like, don't tell, don't play all your players where you get stuff, right? Like, don't tell your players your tricks. Let them, you know, assume you're a mysterious genius, right? Like, it does. And if you haven't seen the Prestige, watch it because it explains this point far better than I'm explaining it now. Don't tell your people. Don't ever tell your players your secrets. It, it will not help, right? Um, the, the mystery in their mind is much better than the reality you will explain to them. Okay. All right. So, so basically that's the sourcing last, right? Why should you, so I, I, why should you use miniatures minimum 55 to 66% of your game, your combat encounters? Why should you use high end, very specific miniatures and representative miniatures rather than just doing theater of the mind, okay? Now, theater of the mind has its place. It should be 33% to 45% of your um, combat encounter should absolutely be used for theater of mind to speed your game and and to avoid railroading, okay? But 55 to 66% of your game should be using very high-end, very well-crafted, very well-maintained miniatures, right? And by the way, the quality on miniatures is just soaring through the roof. I just saw Dungeons and Dragons now has sprue miniatures, exactly same style, quality, um, build build ratios, everything as Warhammer 40k. Right, like you can literally cut your your dude off of a sprue, sand them down, color them, like it, like the same level of quality as Citadel Games has had for 20 years, right? Um, and so, and and the 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 amount, the size of miniatures, the quality of miniatures, the variance of miniatures, just continues to go through the roof, right? So why should you use uh, miniatures? Well, in order to help Dungeons and Dragons. Not sure if you're aware of this, but Dungeons and Dragons has set the standard for miniatures, and it is the the number one, a number one driving force for miniatures in the world. Okay, all right, so. Reaper Bones, Pathfinder, um, those are great miniatures, and you can get fantastic Dungeons and Dragons miniatures through those companies. Okay, there's also official Dungeons and Dragons miniatures, but here's the kicker, right? Lots of people get official uh, get official Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, when people buy official Dungeons and Dragons miniatures, they use them in Dungeons and Dragons games, right? When people buy Reaper Bones. They use them in Dungeons and Dragons games. When buy people buy Pathfinder miniatures, they use them in Dungeons and Dragons games. Yes, there's a few people who re use Reaper Bones for a few other, uh, t you know, fantasy tabletop role playing games, but the va but the flow is this way: you buy D and D miniatures from official source Wizards Wizards of the Coast, Wiz Kids official Dungeons and Dragons miniatures. Those go directly into a, a Dungeons and Dragons game. There might be one in a hundred people who buy D and D miniatures or use it for another game. The flow on Reaper Bones and on Pathfinder, tons of people buy those and they go directly into Dungeons and Dragons. And the reason why is Dungeons and Dragons blew war games out of the water. The vast majority of war games didn't even use miniatures; they used tokens. They used like little chits and cardboard squares and all this other, you know. And it was pretty rare to have miniatures used for, for wargaming. Dungeons and Dragons set the standard in 1974, and it sets the standard today, right? Every other game follows Dungeons and Dragons when it comes to miniatures, right? Dungeons and Dragons was the first to have a full set of all five, you know, all five colored dragons, all at as big as two pumpkins, you know, like no other game did that. They set, they not only did they set, set the standard, with Ralph Partha and all these, you know, and you know Reaper and all these other companies, um, companies making figures that would be used in Dungeons and Dragons, even though they were third party, that Dungeons and Dragons set the standard at 25 millimeter to 32 millimeter. They literally just set the standard, and the reality is, the more miniatures that are made and sold, and the more the miniature, uh, the miniatures industry grows the more people are attracted to Dungeons and & Dragons and not other games. Miniature, Dungeons & Dragons owns miniatures 
no matter who makes them. Because the reality is, if you are out there and you're a third party creator and you create miniatures, the odds that your, your miniatures are gonna be used in a Dungeon Dragons game are much higher than if you make them for a specific game. And that's one of the reasons why, I, to my knowledge, Pathfinder is the only, the only other um, tabletop fantasy role-playing game that has been able to consistently have a collectible line that people actually buy in real numbers rather than just like a few sets here and there, right? You know. So the reality, and, and, and the reality is when it comes, to, uh, even though Pathfinder is doing great, they aren't really doing what, what Wizards of the Coast is doing, right? Wizards of the Coast is just at a different level. They have all the dragons and they also recently made uh, Tales of the Yarn. So every single time any kind of a major breakthrough happens in miniatures, it happens for Dungeons and Dragons. First, it was all the dragons being printed in these massive, you know, uh, collections. And now um, it's happening with uh, Tales of the Yarn and Portal with the first $300 miniature set. Also Dwarven Forge, like, like the vast majority of that gets used for Dungeons Dragons and virtually no other games. So the reality is use miniatures and buy from whoever you want because as miniatures grows, so grows Dungeons and Dragons. All that's my opinion. That is the end of my, uh, ta my theater of the mind versus um, mini miniatures and terrain. And here's the answer. You absolutely cannot do 100% of either, you can't do 100% TTOM, you cannot do 100% miniatures. If you're doing that, you're doing Dungeons and Dragons wrong, in my humble opinion. And you, uh, and you are, and if you're a player, you're capped at $30 of miniatures on the table, $15 of representative miniatures. If you're a dungeon master, you're capped at $3,000 for your collection. $300 on the table, $150 of representative miniatures on the table at any one time. And your, excuse me, your collection is capped at three thousand dollars for minis, for three thousand dollars for miniatures, fifteen hundred for representative miniatures. You need to source from actual tabletop miniatures, uh, miniature manufacturers. You need to source from board game from the board game industry, and you need to source from non gaming sources. Those three, right? That's the right way to do it, and you. And your correct ratios is you should be running theater of the mind 33% of the time to 45% of the time. And you should have good, solid miniatures on your table um, 55 to 66% of the time. That's the definitive answer from J. Scott Garibay. Uh, I'm putting a nail in it, right? Because everybody answers this on the, on, on the internet, but I think I answered it best. And if you think I'm wrong, put the link below who, who covered it better. I'd love to see it. Uh, all that's my opinion. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on theater of the mind versus miniature miniatures over um, miniatures and terrain in the comments below. Thank you very much. Please consider like subscribing and have a wonderful millennium.